right, well, welcome back to the Open Bible, Open Life Podcast. I'm Kyle Mercer. I always have a lot of guests on, and but today I'm particularly excited because Two Cities Church would not exist if it was not for the Summit Church and Pastor J.D. Greer. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. My, where's the open Bible? I'm ready to open my I, I know. Someone else made that joke. Okay, we're going to talk about, we try to open both, both gotcha, authority okay. and authenticity we love say it. here. I love there we go. I like to keep yep. it simple. So uh, as we get to know you, a couple things. First of all, what does J.D. stand for? Uh, my first name, my middle name. Yeah, tell me what the... Uh, Joshua so, David, John David. My parents were bad alcoholics when I uh, was born, so it was Jack Daniels, and then when I got <laughs> saved, Jesus Disciple. <laughs> no, kidding. That would be a great story, though. That no, would be an amazing uh, story. It would be an amazing... Yeah, James David. Uh, okay, is, James yeah, David. Okay. Right. So uh, Now, my, did you always go by J.D.? Or is there like a moment in the in like first fourth grade, grade like, at Salem Baptist Christian School here in Winston-Salem, Okay, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Frazier, didn't think it was fair that I only got to write two letters. Oh. And everybody else had to learn to write their name out in cursive. Uh-huh. So she made me do it as J- I was James for a year. Okay. And then after that year, I, I But your parents from a young age always just called you JD. They looked a little baby, a little infant, and said JD, which <laughs> feels weird, you know, but yes. Yeah. Okay. JD. So you grew up here in Winston Salem. Okay. Yep. Um, tell us about what it was like to grow up here and particularly a little bit of your spiritual journey here. I know you were at Salem Baptist. I think you were at Salem Baptist. The whole time. The whole time. Okay. Entire... So tell us the story of like that church in Winston, its influence on you, and how that shaped you into the yeah. Christian and pastor you are today. Wow. Yeah. No. So my parents moved here in 1976. Okay. Uh, America had just turned 200. I just turned two. Okay. Um, my dad had was uh, had really just come. To, basically, had just gotten saved. Yeah. Mom was in the midst of a transformation of her own, but they were they, at this point. I would still classify them as cultural Christians, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, somebody at my dad's work um, at one of the hosiery, he, he worked in the textile industry. Yeah. Invited him uh, to go to church at this exciting, growing church where the preacher could just preach the paint off the walls. His name was Doctor E. C. Sheehan, and uh, Salem Baptist Church. My dad went, and basically, God used that. They either got saved or they came alive in their faith, yes. one of those two. Um, thankfully, this church was, even though it was fast growing, was very committed to discipleship. And so my dad personally actually was um, discipled by Dr. Sheehan. And um, because of that, my dad became a, a spiritual giant. Yes. In fact, I always use this, I use this example with our church that um, a few years ago, Dr. Sheehan died, and my dad and I drove down to his funeral down in Georgia, and uh, where he was living at the time. And my dad on the way down there, he said... Uh, he said, you know, he said, I know Dr. Sheehan's preaching changed my life. He said, but I'm telling you, I cannot remember a single sermon that man preached right now. He said, but what I can remember, what I can remember is um, hearing him pray for somebody in the middle of a grocery store that had just lost a child. I can remember hearing him share Christ. With, I remember how he handled criticism. I remember watching him go through life. And he said, it's the things this many years away, it was his life that impacted me, life on life discipleship, not sermons that he yes. preached, which honestly, Kyle, was a little depressing for me because I preach sermons every single week <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that people aren't going to remember. But, but it just it shows the nature of discipleship, that it wasn't about performance. It wasn't about what they had on the weekend. It was just about you know um, doing normal life with gospel intentionality. Yes, yes. So I grew up in the home of two rapidly growing uh, people who became spiritual giants. I prayed to receive Christ when I was five or six or something like that, asked Jesus into my heart. And, um, you know, around 15 or 16, I, I, sometimes I look at it and I'm like, that was childlike faith at five or six. And then I just wandered away from it and God brought it back. Sometimes I'm like, well, no, that was just the form of godliness without the power thereof. Mm. And I, I didn't get saved. I was 16. Who knows? I have no idea. Yeah. But at, at 16, God really got a hold of my, my, my heart. And um, I told a story today in our session. I'll just I'll, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of it. But one of the first things I did is I wanted because at that point our church was it, it was plateaued and declining, and it hadn't grown in years. And Dr. Sheehan was long gone, and and uh, I just remember pray, I was like praying for revival to come to Winston Salem, come to Salem. Yeah. And I was just childlike enough in my faith as a new Christian that you know, we pray for an hour on Sunday mornings before church started. Me and mm. a couple of my friends, and every Sunday I'd think. This is going to be this the week. Is it. This is it. It's going to be the week that fire falls, and You're I'm walking you, around the building. Just, I'm like, yes, when's yes. it going to? It's going to be. It's Azusa Street. It's Pentecost, and uh, every week I left disappointed. Hmm. It just felt dead, and uh, I remember struggling with that, thinking like, man, God, you know, why wouldn't you answer that prayer? Hmm. Uh, when the first time I preached at your church, yep. I'm standing on stage, and it's one of the many services you now host, bumper to, I mean, you know, wall to wall people, in the midst of a revival, yeah, 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 is yeah, yeah. what I would call yeah. what, what you got here. You know, we're we're here. We can, you know, uh, Salem Baptist is just right down the road. I'm seeing people in the audience that are from actually I grew up with at Salem, and uh, the Holy Spirit just whispered to me on stage. He was like, mm-hmm. he's like, 
just wanted you to know I heard you. Yeah, power. I heard you when you were praying. And um, I sent, uh, it, it, it needed new wineskins. Yeah. And a lot of times that's how God does it is he sends the blessing, but it's it comes in a different form than we think. Yes. But anyway, I, I'm very tied to Winston-Salem. I feel like I'm very tied to your church, yeah. not just because we were part of helping you plant, but uh, just because of, of what you're doing here. Um, I went off to college. I'll make this part real quick. Went off to college, think I was going to go into law because Dr. Sheehan told me, go, don't go into the ministry unless you absolutely have to. So I was going to go into law. And while I was there in college, I started to teach a Bible study. That grew from three or four people to several hundred. Lots of people were coming to Christ. Um, people, you know, really feeling like the call to the mission field. It was just, it was one of those revival type things where more energy and activity is happening um, apart from you than through you. Yeah. I, to me, it's kind of the definition of revival is it's like it's just happening everywhere and you're just like, what's happening each yep. week? Um, that's what it felt like. And I just remember in the midst of that thinking, God, I. I love I, I like law, but I love this. Will yes. you let me do this? At the same time, God was giving me a vision for the 2.8 billion people in the world that have never heard the name of Jesus. And as a junior, and how are you getting that vision? Um, is that personal reading of Scripture? Is it your their books? Of course, it's the yep. influence of Salem Baptist. But what, it what, is what? the influence of Salem Baptist. It was Keith Green. Do you remember the old? Dude, so I, when I became a Christian, yep, I, I became a Christian in 2001, and somebody gave me of all things. I was like listening to like you know DMX and like Tupac. I get saved. They hand me Keith Green, and I learned Scripture by listening to his songs. Yeah. The, the sheep and the goats, the prodigal. So, yeah. Do you I mean, see? Do you see all the people sinking yes, down? Don't you, care, don't you care? Don't you care? Yeah. Yeah. So that um, I. You know, I'd, I'd read Jim Elliott's biography. Uh, somebody had given me Adoniram Judson's biography. It was the first oh, book I read man. when I got saved. So those are big things. And then my pastor, my little independent Baptist country pastor at Campbell University. Come on. Um, recommended that I read the book of Romans seven times, you know, because, you know, independent Baptists were big into numbers and seven times is Come Jericho. On. So I did it. And on the seventh time through, it was like God just, hmm. I don't know. It's one of those things, Kyle, where you know the truth in your head. It wasn't a new truth I was learning, but then sometimes it's almost like you start to feel it with your heart. Hmm. And I, I, I just felt what it meant for that many people to be perishing, Romans 10, Romans 2, without even hearing the name of Jesus. And I said, Lord, if you will let me go, please let me go. Mm. I'm not waiting for you to appear in my Cheerios anymore to, you know, call me to ministry or Damascus Road. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All they ever spelled out is, ooh, you know. But yeah. what I was, at that point, I was like, Lord, let me go. And I've actually mm. come to see that more as a much healthier way of approaching the ministry. We mm. know what the Lord's will is. He wants, you know, Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we're sitting around saying, God, what's your will? His will is for you to be used in reaching the lost. Yes. And rather than saying, God... If you interrupt me, you know, by doing something miraculous in my Cheerios, I'll do it. But otherwise, I'm just going to get a job, make lots of money, and tie to the church. Rather than doing that, what we ought to do is say, Lord, how can I be used for global lostness? What's my role in this? Lord, here am I, send me. Hmm. And I felt like God said, finally, you're asking the right question. Yes. And so um, I, I finished up my law stuff and went to to seminary, and then I went to the mission field. Was, were you, was, was the Journeyman program around at this point? Is that what you so, did? You were there for two years. What, what was, the Journeyman what was program that? has been around since the 40s, so okay. yes, it was around. Okay. Uh, I actually technically did one called ISC, but it's, it's, it's essentially the same thing. And uh, yeah, so two years overseas um, after a couple years in seminary. And you were in Indonesia? Indonesia, yeah. Okay, for two years. So my favorite, you've written many books, okay? And I've read <laughs> some of them. Some of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think yeah. I have all of them. I've read some of them. <laughs> uh, my favorite book that you have written is uh, Gaining by Losing. Huh. Uh, for, I don't know, I want I mean, well, I love the cover. And I don't judge a book by its cover, but the way that you yeah. guys had it designed, the gaining is falling into the losing. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I'm, I love language. I love good language. And the whole book is built around plumb lines. But where did you get kind of this vision? So we, we're talking missions, sending. But really, I, I honestly, you, the Summit Church, uh, hopefully now our collaborative, has really been on yep. the front lines of, of trying to create a sending culture. I mean, you're not the first person to say sending capacity is more important than seeding capacity. Rick what? Warren, yeah, I didn't yeah, make yeah, that that's up. right. Rick Warren said it. <laughs> you know, he was quoting someone else probably, but yeah. But to, but to live that out and to start doing that, tell us that journey to becoming, you know, wherever you want to go with it, whether it's the vision for a thousand churches, if it's the story of how it, I don't even really fully know how it first started, but I'm just thinking about the summit church in Denver and that first, and right. and, and then it grows to where, you know, this week you're here today because you just spoke to over 500 people that represent, uh, we have been going to be at right about 90 churches soon, yeah, you know, in this, Lord. yeah, so we're real excited about it, but talk, and we're excited about talking about the future and all that, but tell us how we got here. Yeah, wow, yeah. So I, I did come into... Um, pastoring at Summit with a vision for missions. In fact, I always say that God called me to the pastorate by first calling to me to the mission field, and then he never released my call in the mission field when he reassigned me to be pastor. Yeah. 
So I do, I pastor out of the context of that. And I, I actually think that's probably, and that, that is sort of unique to me, it, or it's a special part of my story, but I think that's healthy for all pastors to think like God plants you, not just for that area, but he plants you for mm. the nations. Yes. And so, you know, came in and just immediately was like, you know, how, how what's, What's God going to do through this church to impact the nations? I hadn't really connected that, Kyle. A lot of it's just because of what I was raised around with um, domestic church planting. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Like, yeah, because nowadays a lot of churches will do church planting; they won't do world missions. Right. In the past, there's a lot of world missions without thinking about church planting. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I, I don't know. I we just who who knows what all the factors are in that? But I started to get exposed to Tim Keller, and yeah. at that point, Acts twenty nine. And you know, man, hearing Tim Keller speak once or twice, I was thoroughly convinced that the New Testament strategy for expanding the Great Commission is to raise up leaders and plant churches in strategic cities. Amen. Yeah, I'm not saying that that anything else is wrong. I'm just saying that is the one prescribed strategy. And so I was like, we, we don't do that. <laughs> you yeah. know, we're, we're reaching, we're, we're supporting Campus Crusade, and and, and I, I still support yeah, all yeah, these yeah. things. Yeah, I love these things. But I was like, why don't why aren't we doing this? And so. Um, I, you know, through a, a series of things, we stumbled onto a guy in our church who wanted to plant. It wasn't actually some at Denver. It was Josh Shank in Youngstown, Ohio. That was the first one. And Whoa. he felt called to plant. And I mean, at this point we were just, I mean, it was the blind leading the blind. We're like, here's some money, do what you, you know? So, um, but over time, God really began to just build the culture into the church and we, you replicate what you celebrate. So we were celebrating and, and we, and then the next couple of plants we just partnered with. I always tell churches when they're starting on this journey, I mean, don't get any grand visions of planting 10 churches out of your church in the next year. Um, just partner with somebody that's doing it, Love it. And, and let that DNA you know, kind of affect you. Um, where did the thousand come from? I don't know. Um, we think, we think it just, I just said it in the midst of a, <laughs> yeah. a church vision thing. I mean, that number's in the Bible somewhere. There's somewhere. A thousand, I mean, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of say this a little tongue in cheek, but, um, you know, I think I probably just said it because it felt right in the moment. Yep. Um, over time, it's. I think it, it. It shows it was from the Holy Spirit, yeah. and I say that not because of the success we're having in it, as much as it is the amount of people that have locked onto that, and their spirit has resonated yes, and said, yes, "This is what we yes. want." And so now, I mean, yeah, I, I guess technically the Summit Church is the first one to say a thousand churches. But when I talk to you, Kyle, and I talk to um, Andrew Hopper, I mean, it, I feel like that is as much yours as it is mine. <laughs> And I don't think you're foot soldiers in this vision that I've given. It's like we're we're we're, we're sitting around the table yeah. together, sharing this vision. And a thousand will probably be too small. Yes. Uh, the vision is a multiplying church m- movement because we know we know that that is how the gospel goes forward. I, I always and I'll, I'll make this real quick. No, say it. But um, the uh, you know one of my favorite church historians, Rodney Stark, says that that the end of the first when the last apostle died somewhere in the late nineties A.D. He said the total number of Christians in the world, total number was 7,530, which is an oddly specific number to me. <laughs> but even if he's all 5,000 yeah, on either yeah, side, yeah. It, there's less than 10,000. Yet this same group, by the time you get to, what, early 300s, is now so numerous that over half the Roman Empire is identifies as a born-again Christian. So how, why, how did they do that without all the things we think are necessary? They didn't have big auditoriums. They didn't have money. They didn't have marketing. You know, they didn't have distribution networks. And he said, it's because they had the one thing we don't have, which is they had the understanding and the inbred DNA that every Christian was responsible to multiply and every church was responsible to multiply. Mm. That's the one thing that they had. Because of that, it's just the power. He says, it's not even that amazing when you look at it mathematically. It's just the power of multiplication. It's the power of compound interest. Um, Compare that, Kyle, to um, the last hundred years in American church history. We've had bigger churches than the apostles would have ever dreamed of. Two cities is bigger than anything the apostles ever spoke yeah, to. Yeah. Um, Summit, same way. Um, Billy Graham has preached to larger stadiums full of people than Peter would have even been able to comprehend. Right? That's happened in the last hundred years. Yeah, amazing. It's been the era of the megachurch. And praise God for that. We yeah. need more of that. I'm not anti-megachurch. Yeah, yeah. I'm a megachurch guy. But during that same hundred years, the percentage of... Americans going to church went down, not up. That's right. So in the midst of all these humongous churches, like Two Cities Summit and ones even much bigger than us, the percentage is going down. Mm -hmm. Yet in the early church, with very few, or really any humongous churches, and multiplying churches, they ended up becoming more numerous than, you know, half the Roman Empire. And it just shows you that our strategy, if we're mainly leaning on 
Billy Graham Crusades, and I love them, and big churches, then then it's actually not going to make a difference in lostness. Mm. I grow a big church, but but we're really going to focus on multiplying leaders. That's where the real growth happens. Yeah. So tell us about maybe just the first. So you, the Youngstown, Ohio. But then how does this begin to be? What is well? It, now it was this. It was, when I joined, it was a summit network. Now it's a summit collaborative. Collaborative. Yeah. Uh, how how, do, how does it get from? Just tell a couple stories early on of like how does this end up being like? Hey, this isn't just the summit's going to plant a church, but we're, we're going to kind of we're, there's going to be relationships. There's going to be retreats, coaching, networking. Yeah. Just tell a little bit of that story. Yeah, I'll use an analogy. Um, there's an old leadership book called The Starfish and the Spider. And I don't know if you've ever read it. It's a short little thing. And basically it compares the starfish and the spider because they both, you know, look at least they're shaped similarly, you know, center with, a, with all these legs coming out from it. Um, a spider, if you crush the head, then it just dies. But a starfish, if you actually tear a starfish, it actually becomes two starfish. It's crazy. Because the, the DNA of replication and the DNA of what a starfish is is in every part of the starfish. And it said that a lot of organizations are like mm. a spider because you got a head and then you've got all these, you know, kind of, it, it's a big organization, but you crush the head, you kill the movement. Mm. Um, we've wanted, always wanted to aspire to be a starfish, meaning that it's not that, you know, I'm the captain, CEO. And Kyle, you're lieutenant number one. Yeah, Andrew yeah. Hopper's lieutenant number two. Anything like that. It's, it's a, well, why don't we just be a starfish movement yes. where the, the the multiplication DNA is in everything. And so that, I mean, two cities are going to have a lot of multiplication influence that that will even go beyond Summit. There are things like this collaborative conference we do together. E even in the little trio that you went through a minute ago of names. Yeah. Um, we dropped network because Kevin Ezell at the North American Mission Board asked us to. He said, let us be, send network. Yeah. Ironically, our first, we were called Sin Network. Kevin Ezell first took Sin from us. Then he took Network from us. He took the whole thing. He took the whole thing. <laughs> so now we're Summit and we added Collaborative. And over the last few years, we're like, I don't know if Summit's name is helpful because we're not trying to be a spider. We're trying to be more of a starfish. Mm -hmm. And I would rather, I mean, even though you're very humble and it's not like you're like, oh, I won't be at something that's called Summit. Yeah. It, it's still like, I'd rather communicate like, yes, we have a history, we have a heritage, but we're, we're a bunch of big L leaders bunch of big L leaders yeah, like yeah, Kyle, yeah. Um, rather than a, a genius with a thousand helpers, yeah, you know, yeah, to use Jim yeah. Collins things. Yeah, yeah. I'd just rather have that. So, so that's where it really started to take off is we started to see leaders like you and leaders like Spence Shelton and Ethan Welch and Trevor Atwood and yeah. and a lot of these guys, Josh Miller. And I can just, actually, uh, once I start naming all, name all nine yeah, of them, yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, they all start coming out of the thing and, and saying, man, these guys are leaders and I want to be a part of a movement of leaders, not, you know, a bunch of foot soldiers. Yeah. So Okay. We thought about church plan. One other question. I want to talk to you a little about world missions. How do you, this is, and I'm going to have Andrew Hopper on this podcast as well. And I want to talk to him particularly just because I'm amazed in 10 years. How much of a sending culture they have been, but but you know in, I, I'm probably misquoting this, but in the SBC, you know, there's no church that has as many full time missionaries on the mission field as the summit. Uh, the last I checked on this was four years ago, and um, the president of the IMB told me, vice president told me that we had more missionaries from summits through the IMB on the mission field than the second church behind us by a factor of seven. Wow. So it's seven times that's more. That's what I want to talk to you about, because okay. you know, we, we talk a lot about short-term mission trips. I don't think here. that's true anymore. I think Andrew's catching up, which I'm delighted. No, no, no. About. I know. Yeah, yeah. he's in. I'm going to have... Yeah, but I would love to hear... what are you, what are, So we, we, we think at our church in terms of there's short-term, there's mid-term, there's long-term. That's nothing new. Yep. Um, we're, I'm very encouraged how we're moving the needle on short-term mission trips. We Great. call them a discipleship microwave. You know, people just... Yeah. They go there and they go, why don't I do at home when I I'm know, yeah. here? They raise $4,000 to go do over there what you've told them to do over here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but it's like, you know, and, and there's a cynical part of me yeah. that goes, is it worth it? But then every time they come back, it's like, no, they saw something, they brought their son, they went with their wife. It's, it's by it, far it, the greatest long-term impact yeah, is that. Uh, yeah. But how do you move the needle with people like to, from short-term to seeing, how, how do you grow a church where more and more people are deciding, and not just, maybe, maybe a large part of it is the college connection, but not just, I'm going to go for two years, but how do you, that's the next step, or, or longer, but how do you grow a church where people are continually asking the question, does God want me to go somewhere long term? So, yeah, and you, I, I hear you say stuff like this and apply it to other things, but the, the cliche quote by Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah. All that stuff grows out of a culture. Um, it takes a hundred, average of a hundred short-term tr uh, mission, like a uh, hundred short-term people to produce one long-term missionary. Okay. So you got a lead measure and a lag measure. So if, yeah. if, if 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 you were now were sitting down saying what's the strategy, because two cities wants to have ten people overseas, 
five years from now, if yeah. that were, that were yeah. the first step. Maybe you've already got more than that. No, but, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. But let's just say that. Then I would say, okay, then one of the first things we can do is you're going to need a thousand people. That's good on short term trips because because a hundred of the out of hundred those one of those will start to say I think God might be moving me, me to yes, this yes. and and it contributes to a culture a huge thing obviously Kyle is um, is is the pastor feeling that culture modeling it it's one of the reasons I even though it's very inconvenient I try to discipline myself to going on a mission trip my goal is once a year um, just because I can, and I come back and the stories are fresh and the way I talk to the staff is passionate. Mm. Um, we'll usually once every couple of years we'll do a, a thing where they read. Um, you will read a missionary biography, read Adoniram Judson's yes. biography. We just did that a, a little while ago. When you um, say we, is that your staff? The staff, staff okay, have the whole great. staff do it. Um, we, you know, have, have tried to rethink all parts of the church to think about how do we put the culture of sending in there. I mean, you've been in our church. You know, it's like the kids' areas are designed like the RDU airport. You know, everything has this feel. We say you were sent, just like you, you do at the end. Um, I will. Uh, I'm looking for ways to work mission stories in. Anytime a missionary's back, we're trying to treat them like a hero. Put them on stage. Try to do a stand innovation for them. You know, tell them what can we be praying about. Love it. I, I, I'm charging our video team, like you know, they, because they're they're everybody wants stories, but I'm like, okay. Here's what we wanted to lay out. We want this many life change stories. We want this many, you know, small group amazing stories, and we need we need you know this many um, mission Missionary stories. stories yes. So you just you're layering the culture, and it's like you know Jim Collins says with the flywheel. First couple of years you put a lot of energy in it, you don't get much out of it, but over time, man, that flywheel. And now it's just like it just I feel like we you know blow on that that flywheel and it spits out missionaries. Yeah, you know, so that's it's culture. Let's talk end today talking about what you just talked to our whole uh, collaborative about, mm-hmm. which I thought was really, 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 really helpful. Obviously, uh, you know, the average person listening to this podcast is a part of our church, Two Cities Church. They won't get to hear this message, mm-hmm. but I just thought, you know, the values uh, of the summit, there of the summit collaborative uh, or collaborative, uh, are, are several. But you really focus today on the value of balance. Mm-hmm. Can you just talk to us about this idea of balance and why you think it's made the summit a unique? Church, uh, you didn't say that. I'm saying that. Yeah. Or, but, but why it makes our net? Because when I think about the values of the Summit Collaborative and the one that I actually feel like is the most distinct. I mean, I I love gospel centeredness, but I see that the Gospel Coalition together for the right. gospel, all lots that. of people. You know, I love multiplication, and there's mm-hmm. so many networks that are trying to do versions of multiplication. I love that. Uh, but I, for me, I, I've thought the both and mm-hmm. the third way church, which I want you to talk about just for a few minutes as we close. Why is that so important, and how do we build that? Yeah, so what I, t- I told today is, is is going early back in my ministry, I always felt a little bit um, like I didn't quite belong in either, in, in the can- different places I was going to. And I hope this doesn't come out as self-righteous. I'm not no. saying I alone was the one figuring things no. out. But, you know, I, I go in my mega church uh, circles, you know, churches that were fast growing. And, you know, it's just like there's a decided lack here of theology. We don't ever talk about church discipline, meaningful membership. We don't talk about growth and multiplication, except... We don't talk about personal growth and multiplication. We just talk about, and I was like, you know, I, remember, I even kind of said this, and I'm referring to a real conversation where the guy's like, "Oh yeah, you're one of the Bible guys." And I'm like, mm-hmm. "We're we're all Bible guys, yes, yes, right." So, but then I go over to my more reformed, you know, kind of Baptist large B groups, and it was almost like growth was a, you know, like a like a negative thing. Like if you're growing, mm-hmm. you're a suspect. Yes, you know, we're growing, but I promise we're Suspicious not compromised. Of success. Yeah. That's and, right. I, and I asked my wife, I was like, I don't feel like I really belong in either group. Is and you know, she helped me identify which group I actually belonged in. But it, it, it was the first tension point of like I, I feel like there's two good things here, and I, I don't want to have to choose between them. I don't want to either be the mega church guy or the Baptist reformed care about doctrine and, and membership guy. I, I really want to do both. Mm-hmm. The result is it's messy. The result is you're getting preached against from both sides. Mm-hmm. The result is you know you're kind of you constantly. I, I didn't say this today, but it's like trying to balance a pole on your finger. Mm-hmm. If you try to balance a pole, you, you, the, you constantly moving. You to, yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. us. We're constantly moving with these things. And so I was encouraging the guys today, encouraging the leaders today, like don't, don't, don't let social media or the the vicious tribalism that's yes, now afoot. Yes. Don't let it force you into making enemies what God sees to be friends. Yes. Um, you know, some things in the Bible are not contradictions to be resolved or options to choose between. They're tensions to be managed. Yeah, love it. And so I so we're like that with um with the the growth versus the you know the depth discussion. We're like that when it comes to being complementarian and empowering women. Yep. I mean, it's, it's like you got to choose. You're either going to be serious about your complementarianism or you're going to be committed to growing women in ministry. 
And I'm like, both of those things are in the Bible. Yes, yes. I want both of those things. Again, the result, we live in constant tension, but, and, and so there's a number of those, and we could go through a liturgical in you know how we approach worship, where where God is instructing us through the mm-hmm. the rhythms of the liturgy versus the charismatic emphasis on freedom in the spirit. I'm like those are both my Anglican friends and my Pentecostal friends have contributed a lot to my understanding of the Christian mm-hmm. life. I don't want to choose one of the camps. I want yep. to be a both yep. and. Yep. 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 And I realize that I, I, I definitely don't mean in this in any kind of superiority. Like now, you know. In the middle, me and Jesus over here in the middle have it all. <laughs> but what I do mean is, 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 is there's a lot of things that you should just appreciate the tension in the Bible yes. and leave the tension there instead of trying to identify one at the expense of the other. Yeah. Well, I, I enjoyed your talk today, and I have so enjoyed living out this value, mm-hmm. and and it's it's led people, even in our own church at times, to be confused. I mean, I remember I told the story when I was speaking yesterday uh, that we had a moment where a lady came to our church this years ago, and she said, uh, Pastor Kyle, I just was on desiringgod.org. I thought, oh no, okay. and I and I, yeah, love, yeah. and I love John Piper. Oh, right, right, we both exactly. do. Yeah. And she said, I read a, I read a, um, a, a, a blog he wrote about how you should have your kids in the worship service, <laughs> and he said, have them on your chest and sing anyway. And I, and it was really sweet, and she was well meaning, and she right. said, and it's making me question if we need a kids ministry. Right. And and what are we right. doing here? And I had to have this moment where I'm like, okay, well, first of all, I know why we have a kids ministry. And right. Here, here's, here's but right. It's like yeah. we actually believe Great in example. both. Yeah. Like what I'm saying is, we believe. In fact, we have multiple services. So if you want to serve one and put your kid in kids ministry, and you want to bring them in, that's totally fine. Right. But that's another tension. It's like, there, do you know? Do you do age and stage ministries, or do you say the family will take care of all of it? It's like, well, first of all, you're idealistic right. because everything is broken. Like you know, right. who's going to reach the non-Christian kid who doesn't have godly parents? Who's going to reach the single mom's kids who yeah, doesn't point. have a father? You get it. Right. And so I, I think that part of it, and I didn't say this in my talk yesterday, but. I think there's a point where pastors and leaders, and, and not just pastors, but leaders in, in any level of the church, idealism has to die for them at some level. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think every young man is idealistic until he has to build something. Yeah. And so, and I think when you, you go, okay, and, and then you get the gift, like you, you mentioned in your sermon, uh, the gift of disorientation. You know, <laughs> you go somewhere and you're like, this church is being faithful, but this looks completely different, you know? Right. Like, and I think another tension that we've tried, you, you kind of said this, is style and substance. Mm-hmm. We want to have, you know, I think your phrase that I've heard you use before is like, you know, theological precision and cultural relevance. It's like, yeah. you know, what's wrong with trying to have both of those have all of and it. just confusing people? You know, and, and I, I think also, it's what, sometimes why you got to say to people, I think I first heard you say this, but it's like, you got come to our church for six or eight weeks. Yeah. Because if you show up one Sunday and it's the Sunday that I don't know, I'm in Genesis two. You're like, oh, this church, all they talk about is marriage. It's like, well, come back next week, you know? Right, right, right. Uh, or you know, he's 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 really topical. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, I had two verses. That's what happened. Right. Come back when I have fifteen. And then they come back when you have fifteen verses. Oh, he's so theological. It's like, no, right. I just covered more text. That's all right. I did. Right, right. Anyway, uh, as we close, last thing. I keep saying last thing, but I want to hear this. So we talked about all the books that you've written. Mm-hmm. Well, I mentioned that. I say and. Uh, and is there anything that you're working on right now that you can talk about that you're excited about? Well, the functional title, I appreciate you asking that. Uh, my functional title is called Living Quietly. And um, you wrote a book called Living Quietly. I know. And it, yeah, it's, supposed to, it's supposed to mock itself. Yeah, just kidding. But um, it basically is uh, the idea um, that Daniel in the Old Testament, it's the only book in the Bible that's written in Aramaic. The intro and the conclusion are written in Hebrew, but the narratives are in Aramaic. And the structure of the book presents a question, which is you Hebrew people, you Jewish people, you know how to be faithful to God in Israel, in Hebrew, can you do it in Aramaic? What does it look like for Daniel to be a servant in Nebuchadnezzar's palace, Mm. who is so countercultural and so committed to truth that he's cast into the lion's den, and yet so beloved in that palace that the king comes and weeps by the lion's den all night, hoping he gets out okay? I'm like, how do we achieve that in our culture? Because that seems to be what Jesus was. You know, he's full, filled with grace and truth. So, so truthful that they crucified him. His crucifixion is a joint project from both the right and the left, the religious and the non-religious. Yet he's so full of love that the the, the prostitutes and the tax collectors want to be around him. Mm. And so it's it's unpacking this idea of what does it mean to live as an exile? And the thing that that Peter says and Paul says is 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 you live quietly meaning you learn how to glorify God in blessing your city and doing a job. So I unpack, like, what does it mean to be a Christian in business? What's it mean to be a faithful Christian? Um, the, The flip side is testify loudly. How do you live quietly and testify loudly? The opposite of this is culture war which is where a lot of churches are now, is they want to do culture war, you know, and it's almost like they're Daniel and Babylon thinking that they're going to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Mm-hmm. And God says, Jeremiah 29, 7, don't do that. 
I want you to be in this palace. I want you to be a blessing to the people. I want you to work for the good, the shalom of the city and its prosperity. You'll find prosperity, but the whole time you're going to testify in ways that will get you in the lion's den, but you're going to live with such goodness and beauty and compassion that they just, you know, they're weeping when the, at the thought of you, you going wow, into that. Yes. So in the other verse that I'm building the book around is 1 Peter 3.15, honor Christ, the Lord, he says, and um, you know, be ready to give an answer. And so, so the three parts of the book are honor Christ. What's his mission specifically? Live quietly. What's it mean to be a Christian in you know secular business or secular the secular world? Your PTA, um, your neighborhood, and then testify loudly. What are the ways that we demonstrate mm. the beauty of Christ? So that's what that's I'm great. working on. When is it coming out? Uh, I just know. finished the first draft of the manuscript, which okay. basically means it looks like verbal vomit onto the page. Okay. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I think it'll come out next fall. Great. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be done by January, and it usually takes nine months for the publisher to you know, get it out. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, thank you, man. Thank you for your influence on the Summit Collaborative, now the Collaborative, your influence on Two Cities Church. Mm-hmm. We genuinely, I said at the beginning, we wouldn't be where we are if it wasn't for the influences in your life, like Salem Baptist and yeah, your, your experiences and, and your vision to continue to gain by losing. So mm-hmm. thanks for joining us today. I hope that you guys will check out any of Pastor JD's books, but especially look forward to next fall with his new book, Living Quietly. Until next time. <laughs> or whatever person. title it comes out with. Who knows? Or yeah, whatever <laughs> title. So anyway, see you next time on Open Bible, Open Life.